First, the universal supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ must take the lead here. He is given to be the head over all things to the church. The church is Christ's. He has loved her, redeemed her, chartered her, and given her a constitution, immunities, and laws, and officers. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof, but is himself Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. The Reformers saw this truth in the light of Scripture and contended for it against claims asserted and exercised in opposition to it. In the preface to the propositions concerning church government and ordination, this truth is brought to view in a series of appropriate quotations from the scriptures. In these passages, the universal supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ stands connected with his headship over the church. He is given to be head over all things to the. Uh, he is given to be head over all things to the church. While the attention of the reformer was very, was very particularly directed to the headship of the redeemer over the church, it was the spirit and aim of their whole procedure to bring the nation, as well as the church, into subjection to Christ. In their solemn covenant, they confessed, These kingdoms are guilty of many sins against God and Christ. They were reverentially awed with the necessary moral supremacy of Jehovah. They regarded this as now taking effect, by appointment of him who has given all judgment to the Son, as the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And they viewed this universal supremacy as essentially connected with his headship over the church. The headship... The elusive headship of Jesus over his church was the grand and leading principle of the Second Reformation, into which all its other principles may be resolved. Secondly, another leading principle of this Reformation is the spiritual independence of the Church of Christ. The Lord Jesus, as King and Head of the Church, hath therein appointed a government in the hand of church officers, distinct from the civil magistrate. To these officers the keys of the kingdom of heaven are committed. The church receives the doctrines of her faith, the institutions of her worship, her polity, and her discipline from Jesus Christ, independently of all foreign authority. The fathers of the Second Reformation boldly claim and exercised this independence in the meeting of the famous assembly in Glasgow, and they established it in their enactments concerning calls, ordinations, and censures. The reformers did not plead for the irresponsibility of the members of the church to lawful civil authority, nor give to the church a power over the nation. The documents to which we have appealed for her principles settle this point, and profess and enjoin respect and subjection to lawful civil authority. But the reformers of that time contended that the church had from Christ a right within herself to appoint, continue, and adjure her meetings, to discuss and determine all matters within her province, and to give them full ecclesiastical effect, independently of magistratical authority. The Second Reformation was thoroughly anti-Erastian. Thirdly, the supreme and ultimate authority of the Word of God in the Church is another of the principles of the Second Reformation. This grand Protestant principle was universally acted upon in opposition to the claims of the See of Rome and of kings usurping the authority claimed by that See. The Church has authority from Christ for edification but it is not autocratic and supreme. Obedience is due to the church only in the Lord and is obligatory upon the conscience only in the case of power lawfully possessed and exercised in agreeableness to the word of God. The Church of Rome claims to be the infallible interpreter of the scripture and demands implicit obedience to her authority. The Church of Christ addresses herself to the understanding and conscience according to the word of God. The reason of obedience to her is the authority of the word. Princes, excuse me, princes acting in the spirit of Rome require implicit or passive obedience to their authority. But the Reformation gave to men the right of using their judgment and proving all things. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined, and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scripture. There is nothing more prominent in the whole procedure of the men of the Second Reformation than the application of this principle. In their removal of the National Covenant, they condemned the innovations and evils of prelacy as having no warrant in the Word of God. 
and they oppose the claim asserted by popery and prelacy to ordain rites, declaring that God alone is Lord of the conscience, and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men, which are in anything contrary to his word, or beside it in matters of faith and worship. So that to believe such doctrines, or to obey such commandments out of conscience, is to betray true liberty of conscience, and the requiring an implicit faith, and an absolute and blind obedience is to destroy liberty of conscience and reason also. The men of the Second Reformation brought every matter of faith, worship, discipline, and government to the test of the divine word, applying this measuring reed to the temple, the altar, and them that worship therein. They paid a supreme regard to the law and testimony in their faith and worship and church polity. Not the traditions of men, nor the authority of pope, prelate, or prince, not supposed agreeableness to reason, and the fitness of things, not venerable antiquity, not fascinating novelty, not present expediency, not even the authority of the church, but the revealed will of Christ is the immediate, authoritative, and ultimate reason of the church's faith and ordinances. This principle is vital in faith and essential in the church of Christ, and in proportion as Christians and churches act upon it, do they glorify the Redeemer. The reformers, in contending for Presbyterianism, appealed for its great and leading principles to the word of God and the practice of the apostolic and primitive church, thus investing it with the authority of a divine institution and respecting and reverencing it as such. The appeal to the word of God is, is a more facial and satisfactory method of settling ecclesiastical questions than references to the inextricable mazes of ambiguous and disputable acts of remote antiquity. Fourthly, Another principle of the Second Reformation is the subjection of nations to God and Christ. The Reformers regarded magistracy as the moral ordinance of God. God, the Supreme Lord and King of all the world, hath ordained civil magistrates to be under him, over the people, for his own glory and the public good. They regarded civil government not as the suggestion of expediency or an invention of man, like the arts of civilized life, but as the moral ordinance of God, to be erected and administered upon the principles of the moral law, and, in agreeableness to this, the reformers regarded the moral and religious character of rulers, and deferred to the divine word in their legislative and judicial procedure. But besides this, they acted upon the principle of the subjection of civil rulers to Jesus Christ, not that they viewed civil government as originating in the dispensation of grace, but as placed with other moral ordinances under the feet of Christ. Their principles in this manner will appear from the federal deeds to which I have referred. In the, um, in the renovation excuse me, of the National Covenant, they pledge their allegiance to the King for defending the true religion as it was then reformed and is expressed in the Confession of Faith. And in the Solemn League and Covenant, they tender their allegiance to the King in the preservation and defense of the true religion and liberties of the Kingdom. They proceeded upon the principle of magistratical subjection to Jesus Christ. They pled for the independence of the church against Erastian doctrine, and they held the independence of the state against the claims of popery. The men of these times were distinguished by sagacity. They were fruitful in resources and beset with great difficulties, which often quickened invention. But they appear never to have thought of an, entirely, an entire disjunction of church and state. Had they thought of this and made the attempt, they would have found it difficult, if not impracticable altogether. And if they exceeded, they would soon have found that the measure gave, in, uh, gave security excuse me, of independence to neither the church nor the state. But the men of these days sought an alliance between the two, based on broad moral religious grounds, acknowledged by both, and defining the power and objects of both in such a way that each had its own independent jurisdiction while both cooperated in their respective provinces in furthering the great public object of the Reformation. Accordingly, the National Covenant, the Solemn League and Covenant, and the Westminster Confession, to which we have referred for the principles of the Second Reformation, were ratified by the State after being adopted by the Church. Such is the fact of the case, establishing that it was a fixed principle of that period that civil society should acknowledge divine revelation, bow at the footstool of Jesus' throne, and erect its constitution, enact its laws, and conduct its administration in subserviency to the interests of the kingdom of Christ. Fifthly, 
the duty of covenanting with God and the obligation of religious covenants, pertain to the principles of the Second Reformation. This duty was resorted to at that time and found to be eminently useful. In the early dawn of Reformation from Popery, recourse was had to this exercise, and it was blessed as a means of impressing obligation upon the conscience, distinguishing the friends of truth and uniting them one together, emboldening them in the profession of religion, and throwing a protection around their common privileges. They learned this not only from the example of the churches abroad that were in a state of separation from Rome, but from approved examples in the scripture. The Second Reformation commenced with a renovation of the National Covenant of Scotland in its application to prelacy, and it was further matured in its grand design by the Solemn League. This was resorted to as a divinely warranted means of uniting the friends of the Reformation in the bonds of truth, and of uniting the Church and the Kingdom in the conjunct prosecution of the Reformation. Sixthly, the Reformers of those days acted upon the principle of holding fast past attainments, advancing in Reformation, and extending its blessings to others. They appreciated the privileges which were transmitted to them for which were transmitted to them from their fathers, and when threatened with deprivation of them, they stood forth in their defense and held fast what they had. Nor did they stand still as though they were already perfect. They meditated and planned the union of the kingdoms in one happy uniformity and peace, and casting their eye abroad, they contemplated the enlargement of the kingdom of the Savior. They were animated with a spirit to enlarged. Uh, they were animated with a spirit of enlarged love to God and benevolence to men upon religious principles. Such are some of the leading principles which directed the views and animated the actings of the fathers of the Second Reformation. Providence raised and brought into the field at that time a race of men distinguished alike by high intellectual, moral, and religious qualifications, who stood forth in defense of religion and liberty in perilous days, the friends of the Church of God and of their country's best interests.